So I am so, so very excited. I want you all to know I have two of the best journalists in the world in the house. They work for one of the best publications in the world. And that is Rebecca Burns and Matthew Cook. Hello, Rebecca. Hello, Matthew. And we are so glad to have you here with us on Unboss today. How you both feeling? Feeling good. Thanks so much for having us, Senator Turner. Good, it is definitely our pleasure. And so we're gonna be talking about the article that you wrote about what is happening and what is happening in East Palestine, Ohio. But we did get some breaking news that we want people to watch. Take a look. Rail workers warned us about disaster like this. I heard firsthand months ago about the corporate practice of precision scheduled railroading. Precision scheduled railroading is uh, shorter staff, Longer hours, longer trains, less safety, less maintenance. Do I have all that right? Oh, you got it all right, Tommy. Okay. Rail workers tried to strike over this stuff, but were stopped by Congress. A few weeks later, and here we are. Several Norfolk Southern cars of toxic, highly volatile chemicals exploded fantastically in the tiny town of East Palestine, Ohio. Yeah, they tried to warn them, and here we are. Take a look and thank you for that for most perfect more perfect union. Take a look at what David Sirota put up in a tweet breaking after Ohio derailment at Secretary Pete Buttigieg has no plan to reinstate Obama's break rule despite a warning to Congress that without it there will be more derailments. Buttigieg's DOT, that's the Department of Transportation, is now considering a proposal that may weaken the safety rules if any of you can believe that. So Rebecca and Matthew want to bring you in to talk to our viewers about what happened in East Palestine, Ohio on February the 6th. Right, so as we know last week, um, there was a pretty horrific derailment in East Palestine, um, a small community of about 5,000 people that led to residents uh, being forced to evacuate their homes. Um, so we're still learning about what chemicals were being transported by the freight train and that residents and first responders were therefore exposed to. What the lover learned when we started digging into this situation was that the train that remember had a hundred foot uh, flames coming from it was not being regulated as what's called a high hazard flammable train. So curious, um, considering those photos, uh, you know, that are apocalyptic that we've been looking at. Um, so when we sort of went back to see what the story is here, what we learned is that the rail industry and its lobbyists con succeeded twice over in convincing uh, first Obama era regulators and then under the Trump administration to uh, to gut safety regulations that could have required um, a better braking technology that could have, if not prevented, uh, certainly reduced um, the damage caused by uh, this incident. As we just heard, um, as, as my colleague David's uh, tweet indicated, what we reported on further today is that now, um, uh, the Department of Transportation under Secretary uh, Pete Buttigieg um, is not planning to reinstate uh, the brake safety rule that was repealed under Donald Trump. Instead, um, his uh, department is considering a separate measure to further weaken uh, brake testing requirements. Yeah, just absolutely unbelievable. Matthew, before we bring you in, I want to put up this headline for folks who are watching and they want to see. And I do encourage you all to make sure that you read this reporting in the lever. You need to subscribe. This is one of the best independent publications in the world. Yeah, take it from me. Rail companies block safety rules before Ohio derailment. And that is what Rebecca was referring to. And Norfolk Sutherland helped convince government officials to repeal break rules and corporate lobbyists watered down hazmat safety regs. So Matthew, your take on, I know that the suffering there and the chemicals told that the carcinogenic vinyl chloride, I think that it is, is is all in the air there. I know that the, the residents there are all up in arms as well as they should be. Talk to us a little bit more about what that impact could and may be and some of the other things you may be seeing or hearing on the ground. 
Yeah, I, I mean, what we know is that the rail industry really does not have an active commitment to safety. We've seen this time and again. You know, railroad workers, it's a dangerous job. The rail unions, every time that there's contract negotiations, have broad proposals for reducing overwork, for increasing safety practices on the railroads. Uh, the, this cross union group that's gotten a lot of attention, Railroad Workers United. They have explicitly endorsed uh, these this new braking technology, um, and but what they said to us is that uh, you know 15 years ago, in, and Rebecca helped uncover this 15 years ago, prior to the kind of real corporate greed stock buyback era that we're in now. Uh, Norfolk Southern was championing these new breaks. Uh, they recognized that in the long term, this would make them money. Uh, and so, really, what you have is, you know, the large Wall Street banks uh, encouraging stock buybacks, tying uh, stock price to executive compensation, and that means that senior executives at Norfolk Southern don't think beyond the next quarter at all. They don't think about the long term financial health of the business. And I think the other thing that really undergirds this is that it's a huge monopoly. Uh, there is no, you know, railroad, there, while there are multiple railroad companies, they don't compete with each other. Each one of them controls a specific part of the market. And a huge portion of their business isn't just moving supplies, it's extracting rent from owning these under these these railroads uh, that they also don't even maintain very well. No, uh, they so don't. I, and Matthew, I just want to add, I mean, when I was on the Cleveland City Council dealt with the railroads often and the complaints that I would hear from my residents about the fact that point that you just made that they don't maintain uh, their property very well. And it was like pulling teeth just to even try to get a hold of anybody to hold responsible. So this has an impact on the local, you know, regional, state, and federal levels of government. And your point about the, the money, because I, I want the viewers to understand it's always follow the money. Part of your reporting that you put you all put out, and I know that Sirota was part of this and one of your other colleagues also was four writers of this. But then came 2017 after the rail industry donors delivered $6 million to the GOP, they stood in the way of what the Obama administration was at first trying to do in terms of changing the rules, $6 million worth of donations. So they spend in this money to lobby against safety because they believe it's a better payoff. And then the other point that you were making, but instead of investing in the safety features, the seventh largest freight railroad companies in the US, including Norfolk Sutherland, spent one point uh, one nine, 191 billion on stock buybacks and shareholder dividends between 2011 and 2021, far more than the 138 billion those firms spent on capital investments in the same time period. It is absolutely ridiculous that Congress will let them get away with this. And let's put up something really quickly from Twitterverse and Rebecca and Matthew, I would want you both to uh, weigh in on these things very quickly. But we have Robert C. Atkinson Jr. And he puts up 14 miles from my house in East Palestine, Ohio. Norfolk Sutherland assures us that the vinyl chloride spilling from the tanks of this derailment train and burning and turning into hydrogen chloride as it rises in the atmosphere. is basically Robert saying they telling him it's nothing to see here. There's nothing to worry about. And then this next one from Lady Just Fed Up, people with personal chickens in East Palestine are all reporting all of their chickens are suddenly deceased. But the are, but the railroad assures everyone the plume of death from the control explosion is perfectly safe. So any thoughts, uh, final thoughts about that and what do you see happening next? Yeah, it's a pretty stunning regulatory failure. Um, you know, as I noted, what is so terrifying, I can imagine, for residents is that they really don't know what they were exposed to and what the long term uh, health impacts of that are going to be. Um, in terms of what we might see next, um, you know, as, as I said, uh, we really haven't seen steps by Secretary Buttigieg's uh, Department of Transportation to reinstate some of these critical rules. Um, but as Matthew just noted, there is a push. Um, by rail workers, by rail unions, um, and also by former uh, former safety regulators, uh, former members of the Federal Railroad Administration. 
um, to move to, uh, you know, force the railroads uh, to do these kind of technological upgrades that at one point they agreed, um, you know, are, are sound scientifically and would make sense in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, listen, we're gonna have you both back, Matthew and Rebecca. We appreciate you being here. And I wanna end with a tweet from More Perfect Union here, Norfolk Sutherland, the rail giant who's trained, derailed in East Palestine has offered to cut the town a check for $25,000. But 5,000 people live there, so that's just $5 a person. And the company is worth $55 billion. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, The Lover, for your reporting. We are going to stay on top of this and we're going to have these wonderful, magnificent, magnificently talented investigative journalists back on Unbossed.